Well, let's talk about broadcast signal intrusion. Um, and let's, you know, and speaking of which, let's let's start as any good story starts at the beginning. What was it about this script and this project that really intrigued you, Jacob? Um, I think it's that I felt very unsettled by the material and I didn't know why I was unsettled by it. Um, I, um, I don't really get freaked out by, I mean, I'm not very squeamish and I don't really get freaked out by horror movies um, on a, like a, a deep level. It's more of an analytical thing or more of a sort of um, in, like appreciating the art, art form of it, you know? Like my horror director friends and I would always sort of speak the way that I think comedians talk about jokes when they're running them past each other is like, oh yeah, that's scary. Instead of saying, instead of being scared, it's like, oh yeah, that's very scary. But this, but this, this material like really unsettled me. And then I wanted to know more and I wanted to investigate this feeling further because there was actually no, I didn't totally even, I couldn't even put my finger on it. It wasn't like a phobia I have or any, any sort of thing like that. It's just that there was something, there's something about videotapes and, and even something about things that have an uncanny valley, like unsettlingness, because they're like something very mundane, but there's something just off from it. Um, and that's sort of, that, that, that applies to sort of the first, you know, chunk of the movie. And I think that that was, really where I was like, like, I need to know why I feel this way. Why am I so freaked out by this? And then that sort of really drew me into the, the, in the same way that if you were sort of going into a rabbit hole about like a broadcast signal intrusion, um, mystery, an unsolved mystery, like the Max Hedrum incident, it initially starts as just like a curiosity and then becomes a fascination. Yeah, you know, in terms of like, and we were talking DPs earlier, like, what was it about this kind of like analog world of videotape and, you know, uh, and all that, and as we live in this digital age that you wanted to kind of capture with Scott when you were developing the cinematography and the look visually of this movie? Well, this movie is definitely attempting to, to sort of take the form of a 70s paranoia conspiracy thriller. Mm -hmm. And of course, Gordon Willis being the cinematographer for Alan Pakula's Paranoia trilogy. He is he is of course one of the greats of all time. Um, but we looked at a lot. It was just a matter of sort of creating that that vibe. But it's also looking at something like Vilmos Zygmunt's work in Blowout, um, and which is a completely different sort of form of cinematography than what Gordon Willis was doing. And then how can we use those tools to kind of create this feeling of anxiety. So we updated it with the story and what happens in the story and sort of the structural elements of the narrative, but then the like the photography and everything, it needed to feel like it was a movie perhaps that would have been really prescient in an earlier time. Um, uh, ben also did that with the score, which is like, he took the score and ran it through video recorders to kind of degrade it, you know? So it was like the idea of like having the movie, the sort of structure of the visuals that Scott and I sort of talked a lot about was like, can that sort of become like his psyche, you know? Or we shoot it really formalistically in the first part. And then it eventually kind of unwinds like, like the videotape does for the main character. Early right. On. And, you know, with James, you know, we're seeing a protagonist that is just progressively, degressively, prog either way, he's just consumed by his obsession. He's assumed by, consumed by his paranoia. How, in terms of like, how is it, I mean, we talked about cinematography and score, but how is it kind of conveying that with like pacing? Because there's a sense, like you almost feel as tired as this guy at some points in the movie, because Harry, you know, he really conveys that with his performance. I mean, well, Harry's brilliant. I mean, of course, he is just wonderful to work with, but also very smart about rhythm, which is also something that I'm very interested in. Um, I think because this is like a very first person subjective narrative and all of the sort of good and bad that comes with that, meaning like it's a first person subjective, but also because his grip on the differentiating between 
the media he's consuming and his dreams and the future and the past all kind of starting to blur, then within that, the audience is taken, hopefully, if we did our jobs, is taking on a ride that is similar to what he's going through while also be having the privilege of having a, a parallax view of, you know, pun intended, like of his, of what he's doing so that we can also have some tension and suspense in being afraid for someone who we, who we kind of live inside of. So we see this person when we get inside of him doing mundane things and we just sort of, he's active and he's, he's trying to accomplish tasks and we're with him. And then hopefully it'll start to like, you'll start to get the feeling of paranoia the same way he does. And I think Harry is a, an amazing actor. He can draw you in because he's so relatable and he's very charming and he's, he's very good looking and all these things, but he also, so when he starts to unwind and he starts to go down the rabbit hole and starts to lose a little bit of a grip on, on some rationality, then it starts to feel unsettling. Yeah, I do like that, you know, as paranoid and as disorienting at times intentionally that the narrative can get as we look at the world through Harry's or James's perspective. One of my favorite scenes in the movie is his like rapport that he forms with Alice, like in that dive bar where they're passing the shots back and forth. Um, how is it kind of like developing that kind of, I don't want to call it a lighter moment because there's a lot going on under the surface for both of those characters, but there's like, there is kind of like a banter going between the two of them. How is it kind of working that chemistry out? I mean, they're fantastic actors, first of all. I love working with, with both of them. And I think they had a lot of chemistry between each other. Um, the, uh, the, it's funny you say that because my friend, a director friend of mine said, I want a whole movie of just these two people solving crimes, um, which I was like, that's the spinoff series. Is that, yeah. But um, uh, I sort of always look at everything as like, every, you know, it's like what Mike Nichols was quoting Elaine May as saying like, every scene is either a seduction or a negotiation. And if you notice, there's a lot with both of them because she is someone who is like streetwise and she's kind of had to like hustle her way into situations because of, you know, where she's ended up in life and, and not really, and feeling like just to survive, she has to do these things. So a lot of their scenes are simply just negotiations. You know, they're, they're making deals. And I think that how, the, how they react to those deals is actually where you can get a lot of this sort of um, interesting development of them as, as a, like a sort of almost a team for a minute, but uh, also as individuals, how they react to those things. Um, and and just, it's just fun with the rat-a-tat tad of that it's like you can kind of find humor that can diffuse some of the sort of heavier potentially maudlin aspects of revealing past trauma or something like that so. right like tonally you know you were mentioning parallax view and it also reminds me of something like the conversation on uh, and invoking coppola and all that like a lot of those movies i love those movies but a lot of them are very self-serious and you know we were talking about how you know comedy and horror kind of have the same rhythm, I think, filmmaking or narratively speaking. How is it kind of knowing when to, one, you're balancing two very different tones, but how do you, how do you kind of nail that, get that kind, of, that kind of push and pull down when you're kind of putting this thing together? This one, the comedy just, I mean, any kind of humor in the movie had to come from essentially just that feeling of, I, I sort of always think of one of the funniest moments in any movie is in The Thing. Um, uh, the, can I swear on this? Yeah, of course. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> God, oh, you're, you're gonna say the kidding me? Yeah. Oh yeah. It's like it's it's like that is a laugh out loud. The audience is in tears. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like that thing of like this. Just it's so horrific. Um, and I do think you're right. I mean, comedy and and or humor and 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 horror and scares kind of live in the same space of suspense, right? It's about it's about building the tension of something and then relieving you with either a punchline or a, a thrill. And um, I don't know. It's just about sort of sort of 
finding moments where you can kind of bring a sort of like satirical, dark, comedic edge to aspects just to make it more human. I mean, that's really the thing. I mean, it, you know, looking at some like all the president's men, mm -hmm. there's a lot of like good humor and banter like you were talking about with with Kelly and 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 Harry it's like between Redford and Hoffman it's like they have moments that are just like they're funny I've seen it in a theater with a big audience and they laugh I mean there's like moments of that but it also just will hopefully like bring you closer to it that's really the goal it's not about trying to like have jokes it's about the idea of like if it's so cold there can be an emotional distance and in order to get drawn into this mystery the same way that he is you have to kind of relate on a human level you know yeah and you know the first time we see james it's clear that this guy is a very obsessive guy like you know you've got the spools of film and everything around him you've got like how is it kind of developing those sets or developing that costuming and stuff with, with sarah sharp and like I mean, it's right down to the to the color saturation you've got in some of the scenes. Like, how is it kind of getting that obsessive nature and just kind of getting the idea that like, look, this guy is already gone, like a little out there when we first see him before this really starts to ramp up. Yeah, I mean, it's just a matter of, I mean, Sarah is a brilliant production designer and she was also the costume designer on this movie as well. She did double duty. She's just an amazing person, but, um, there was actually some story things that she was actually um, our conversations and collaboration. Actually, a lot of those things came out of um, just almost like, what if we give even more detail to this stuff? You know, I mean, detail is a big, important thing for something that's like sort of inspired by things that actually happen, but also like, you know, um, a top period piece, you know, you want to kind of give the feeling of, of, of transporting, but we're also dealing with like three periods here. Right. So it's like you have, or yeah. Cause you have like the seventies conspiracy thriller, which is kind of where like the, the, the aesthetic of it is or the, um, the, the structural components in a lot of ways are tropes. And then you have the eighties, which is when the Max Hedrum incident and in our movie, you know, which is where we took a lot of inspiration, like, that and Captain Midnight and all the other actual real life broadcast intrusions, but also the one in our movie, um, the the Sally Sparks incident, that actually is in the eighties, and then it's set in the nineties. So we have to kind of find a way to to make all these time periods work for the movie, as opposed to being something that's just cute and cool retro. It's like it's really meant to give a sense of of what it's like to be in the main character's purview. But anyway, a lot of that stuff was just actually like reflecting the story, you know? And um, there's a lot of like storytelling that's done in the costume design, the production design, even in something like the, the house toward the end of the movie, which Sarah didn't actually have to do much because that is one of the greatest locations I've ever seen. Um, and for all those who haven't seen the movie, it has real end of first season of True Detective vibes for sure. <laughs> yeah, right. I um, know. Just to, well, I was just just gonna say just to close this out and to kind of like parallel the the opening of this. You were drawn to this project because there, you found something unsettling about it. What do you hope audiences kind of walk away from? Like, what do you hope that it kind of like unearths and maybe kind of unsettles them and while thrilling them at the same time. I would love it if it, I would love it if the, you know, what I call the parking lot conversation, you know, the, the, the after movie coffee conversation actually happens because, you know, you see a lot of good movies that then you just don't really think about. And then there's some movies that maybe you're a little bit unsure about, but you can't stop thinking about them. And I just, I, what I hope is that um, it sticks, it sticks in there and maybe perhaps gives some, some exciting and maybe it has an exciting life for the uh, for audience after the movie is over you know maybe it's like whether you go down your own rabbit hole of something that was that the movie inspired or or an argument with a friend about what you think was the truth of some of the of the things that may seem a little bit more ambiguous um that's really the the, the hope is just the like it's just like the 
thinking about it and talking about it because those are the movies that I aspire to to make and those are the movies that I love and we can only hope to have something like that, I guess.